Okay, we are restarting. Um, now, has everyone handed in their voting paper to serve for counting? Okay, so everybody who got a blue card has filled in a voting form and given it to Sue. So we're counting the votes at the moment, um, and basically the intention is that we will have a, 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 a result to announce um, just before lunch. Um, so, um, William, are you ready to give your presentation? So William is, is Fork Systems Engineer, um, and um, as usual, William will be, and, and, and also, we're in his home country for the first time. So um, <laughs> last time we were in Canada was um, Toronto um, three years ago. So, uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's nice that you didn't have to travel far. So um, William is going to be giving a, a brief update on the state of our, <laughs> on the state of our systems. All right, thanks, Keith. So this is gonna be really quick and painless. I promise you won't be dead at the end. So first bullet summarizes the entire status of the infrastructure of ORC. Go read the last deck from the last workshop. And you should read it because it's interesting, A, B, informative, and C, that workshop had a lot of good content that you should read. So what else is new? Um, it's pretty much our infrastructure is fairly stable. Uh, for the moment, anyways, services, the systems, the data archives, it's all pretty routine. Um, our data archives are undergoing a massive change, though. We're looking at consolidating down from our existing footprint, which is a rack, I would say a rack and a half at present. Um, yeah, I said some of this. So we have um, some, some Microsystem X4500 servers, so 48 disks, I think, they go in, sit vertically. Collectively, it represents about 50 terabytes of disk space of our archives. So it's not a small chunk. It's actually something sizable. But there's limitations and age coming into play. Plus, the relocation is going to force us to consolidate all that stuff. What I can report is that all the thumpers are actually in shutdown state. So we're in very good shape. But wait a minute. That's 50 terabytes. Where did it go? Well, what happened was we did an upgrade in early June of one of our existing file servers. It's actually a newer generation based on a super micro platform. And uh, we swapped out the disks. We went from 1.5 terabyte disks to four terabyte disks. That's actually pretty good. And we managed to move a lot of the data that were on the Thumper systems onto FS2. FS3 is what we're going to upgrade next. That's a two terabyte platform going to a four terabyte. So we're scaling up really nicely. We're consolidating down to a smaller footprint. Uh, but on balance, we're going to end up with the same amount of disk space and capacities at the end, which is good. We haven't gained a lot, but that's because we still have a lot of slack. So about 309 terabytes totally, or total, and uh, FS1 is our backup system. That has consolidated all the other file servers' content onto for you. So, uh, and that's using a storage, I think it's called a storage pod S45 for those of you who are interested in building or rolling your own systems instead of spending triple or quadruple the cost to get something similar. Um, all that data, regardless of where it is, is actually available through the analysis servers for your enjoyment. Uh, we have some ongoing data collections. This is unchanged from last time. Uh, as Keith mentioned, RSAC002. We've added, I think, two further root servers that started supplying us data. So we have a cron job that runs on one of their servers pulls that data down nightly, updates it, keeps a local copy. Researchers are free to go off and have a look at that, all that aggregated data for their enjoyment. Uh, we are also doing long-term AS112 queries, um, collections of those queries. Ottawa Internet Exchange is part of its membership contribution. Every two weeks sends AS112 data, and it's been doing it for the better part of almost a year, and that's probably going to conclude in December and maybe even continue. And the bonus of that is we have RFC 7534, the successor to the original AS112 operations uh, RFC. Uh, we actually captured the before, during, and after when uh, IANA did the magic. Um, and DSC, uh, the story with that one is we were spread across three different systems to conduct the collection and analysis and the processing. This worked well as a temporary solution for two years probably the longest temporary solution in the history of DNS ORC. All that was finally consolidated onto one box. 
which wasn't doing very much, and idle boxes make me nervous, so it had to do something. So just a reminder again about Doodle 2016, it's coming next year, uh, most likely right in the middle of our, our potential move or not, we'll see how that works out. Uh, some of the things to keep in mind is uh, we may be switching to a high performance networking version of Secure Shell for doing the uploads. That may or may not impact you, but it would benefit you if you also adopted the same thing. It's just a faster transfer process. Uh, it's a gigabit uplink currently into ISC's network, so why not take advantage of it? Uh, and it'll get the data off your systems faster in case you're uh, looking for space. I know with Ottawa Internet Exchange, there's always a space issue, so we gotta delete it as soon as it gets uploaded, and it's best to get it across the network as fast as possible. So we're experimenting with that probably in November. Uh, but watch for the announcement for the next official diddle sometime in January. This is, will be the, the, the kickoff of the test series. So we like to test out the system, make sure nothing's rusted, nothing has broken in between, especially with all the moves going on on the data archive side. And uh, we're hoping that FS5, which is a donation we got from Farsight, if I remember correctly, uh, is upgraded in time because we'll probably be using that as the processing engine for the Diddle data. That's simply because for the past several years we've been using one of the file servers to do this. That's not the purpose of the file server to, to, to be a processing engine, but it, it's time that's gotten its own processing dedicated server because we also have a, I think it's now an 11 or 12 terabyte database consuming space on that file server as part of the processing backend. It's gotta get off. We need that space. One thing that may be new to you and we'll probably be approaching some folks as to their opinion on this, as you all know, HROOT is renumbering and Keith and I had discussed this previously, should we actually do a micro diddle in December, November, December timeframe to collect this data, see what's, what happens. And um, we may be doing a very small data set on asking everybody to, to pile in. So again, uh, details will be fleshed out, I hope sometime this month. But the question, the key question about doing this is so what? Why do we wanna do this? But benefit is there, is there a benefit to the researchers? Probably. Is there a benefit to ORC doing it? We're relocating, so it's a little hard. Um, so future, uh, so I kind of jumped the gun. As some of you know, may know, uh, ISC has asked uh, the Colo people, look, it's time, we're calling time on this, and on this effort, and it's time for you guys to leave in an orderly manner, hopefully, as soon as you can. We're affected by that as well. So it's also an opportunity for us to not just continue doing the routine, but also to look at the more detailed we have a lot of research services. We have a lot of miscellaneous efforts going on. Are they worth continuing into the future? Pretty much a lot of this stuff is on the table. And I think Delaney is gonna to speak to DSC a little bit. Should we just can DSC? Just stop it. Is it worth to this community to continue doing it? Um, it's an open question. And I would say that pretty much everything is on the table for discussion about whether or not to continue because we have to consolidate and we have to move to a space that's effective and won't damage the sustainability for, of ORC. Um, we do have a, some discussions going on about a backup site irrespective of all of this. Uh, that's been an ongoing discussion and if we can get that backup site uh, built up in time for the move, it won't disrupt anybody who's doing research on the Diddle data set because we'll simply ask them to do it on the backup site instead. Um, not its an original intent, but hey, if it's there, why not take advantage of it? Uh, and the end. Any questions? Roy, come on up to the mic, if you can. Um, my, my name is Roy Arends, I work for ICANN. Um, a question about um, um, age root. Um, if you do the mini digital data in November, December, uh, may I recommend that you do it on both old and new HROOT? Yeah, we would, we would be looking at, at that. We, we reached out to HROOT proper. I think Keith did. He may be able to speak to this a little bit more. He did reach out about offering to do a little bit more monitoring than, than we would offer normally. And uh, I'll ask Keith to see if, what the response, if anything, he got. Yeah, I, I, I saw that and I responded to the announcement asking if they would be willing to take part in a ditto. Um, and I didn't get any response. 
Um, so, you know, I'd, I'd love to get GNH route more involved in OWARC, but I don't know how to do it. So if anybody um, has any ideas how to do that, we'd love to hear them. Okay. We, we, we might have an idea. Thank you. All right, thanks. Anyone else? All right, thank you very much. I'll hand it over to Keith, who will hand it over to our next speaker. Thanks, William. Okay, thank you, William. Um, so, um, one more staff report for you um, from uh, Delaney Kamlani, who's our um, project development manager. So, um, Delaney's gonna just tell you a little bit about the progress that we have made um, on various of the, um, the projects that OARC is involved in, has been involved in, uh, and aspires to be involved in. Hi. Um, so, first I wanna talk a little bit about DSC. As um, some of the other speakers have mentioned, it was a really, really small sample size. I think it's probably less than 10% of the people in this room, so 11 respondents. Um, for me, it's kind of difficult to gather a lot of conclusive evidence with just 11 of you responding. Um, but I will try and tell you what I did find, and then we can talk about hopefully what was inconclusive and what your opinions might be on that. Um, so the first thing I kind of figured out from the survey was that um, some of you didn't see the purpose of DSC or didn't remember what it was. Um, obviously it stands for Domain Statistics Collector. It's not the same as Diddle. Diddle, like William has said, happens once, maybe twice a year if there's something significant that we want to measure. DSC happens about every five minutes. Um, and DSC is sort of top ten kind of stuff rather than... Um, what Diddle does. That being said, DSC is uh, kind of our firstborn. It was the first thing that OARC did. So it, in our opinion, it does need to be uh, updated, hopefully. Um, so the other thing I want to talk about is that um, the large majority of you found DSC to be a useful tool um, that you'd like to see stay at OARC. Again, if this is not Go ahead, Dwayne. Hi, Delaney. This Hi. is this is Dwayne. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to clarify that there's sort of two things about when, when you talk about DC. There's there's two different things. There's there's the software, mm -hmm. which OARC now own, owns and maintains, and there's also the the publication of of the data. The um, the, the some members provide the DSC statistics to OARC for 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 viewing. So. Um, you know, when you talk about discontinuing, I, I, I just want to make sure that we know which one you're, or, or, or yeah, I just want to be clear that we're talking about the right, the right thing. So I think you're talking about the, the publication of the statistics more than the, the software itself? I think so as well. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you for helping me clarify that, though. So um, more specifically, uh, a lot of you, or those of you who responded to the survey noted that one of the things we need to prioritize is definitely the development of the tool. It's a little bit outdated. Um, and the other thing is that many of you found uh, the visualization of the sort of data to be important. So since you found it to be important, here are some graphs. Um, this was uh, one of the graphs that was hard to draw a concrete conclusion from, so if any of you have a strong opinion, please you know, come to the mic and let me know or come find me after. Um, and obviously this was how much do you care about us sharing data, and it's on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the highest. Um, so you know, the large, I guess the majority of you here feel it's relatively important, but there's some debate there that um, I wouldn't mind some clarification on. Um, the other thing, this one was particularly difficult because if I'm to secure some resources for us to improve it, I want to know what's the first thing you want us to improve, which is why I asked this question, and the responses were kind of spread. Um, so to help us prioritize, I need to know what you want to see first. Is it a tool that better presents and visualizes the data? Is it a service that interoperates with multiple other DNS data collectors? Um, should OR coordinate a common protocol or format standards for DNS stats tools? Or lastly, should OR provide support and or development for existing tools? Um, if, again, if you could help me prioritize that, I'd be really thankful. Um, some other takeaways from the DSC survey is that 
you know, I asked the question, we're down about 70% um, since before, and why you guys think that might be. Um, some of you said that might be a reaction to more stringent privacy regulations. Uh, others of you said that, um, you know, researchers aren't exploiting this data, so it's not timely and relevant for you anymore. Um, so it's a little bit of a chicken and egg issue there that we're going to try and sort out. Um, we also had uh, some good suggestions on how to motivate you guys to upload data, but if you have more, I am, of course, welcome to listening to those. Um, and we had some good suggestions for how researchers um, can use that data. And among those suggestions would be that um, research can find trends and map the origin of data. They can do a traffic pattern analysis, a threat detection correlation, um, map IPv6 deployment or geographic distribution of various DNS services. Um, so that's, that's all some things to think about. Um, the next step for me is chatting up some of the relevant individuals to this project. Um, so some of you in the survey identified that you'd be willing to give us some resources or help out. I'm going to try and reach out to those of you. Um, if there's other of you that didn't get a chance to fill out the survey but want to talk to me and have an opinion, I'd really, really love to hear from you. Um, and my information will be up at the, the end of this slideshow. Um, that is pretty much all of what I was able to gather on DSC since the survey. Um, and so now I'm going to move on to some other projects. Um, mostly it's business as usual. Um, we, like Keith and William mentioned, we did lose out on a major funding opportunity. There's not a whole lot I can say there, but I'm sure you'll know it when you see it. Um, the other thing is, like Keith and William mentioned, we are moving out of the Redwood City space. Um, that is planned. We're planning for spring, summer 2016. If there's going to be an interruption in the services we're providing to you, you will know well in advance and we will try and minimize those disruptions, so I don't want anybody to worry about that. Um, the other thing is that we, um, we're trying to streamline what we're doing a little bit. So some of the services that may be older and um, not as relevant, we'd, we'd like to retire, not just because we're moving, but because um, we'd like to free up some of William's time and some of our time to work on other projects in the pipeline. So some of the things that are on our list of things that might be retired, and this is something we talked about with the board at our last retreat and that we talked about at our all hands meeting, um, is the port entropy tester, the ODVR reply tester, and um, the DLV tester. If you have an issue with that, we're happy to hear it. Um, we're happy to review that further. If these are things you're still using and you don't want them to go away, let us know and we can try and keep them around for you or, or extract what you need from them. Um, and I think that was about it for me. Um, but if anybody has anything to say about DSC or any other questions about projects, be happy to discuss that. Uh, Ralph Weber, I think uh, these tools that you just mentioned are kind of of great use for the community in general to kind of uh, test DNS as it is deployed right now. So I would be really sad to see them go. Okay. Okay. Hi, this is Anand from the RIPE NCC. Um, so we're one of the parties who actually upload DSC data. Uh, and what we do is we, we upload process data. We don't send raw data. And so one of the questions I have is, um, does uh, OARC actually keep any of the raw XML data files around um, for any kind of research purposes? That um, is not something I know the answer to, but I'm sure Keith or William do know the answer to that one. Yeah. And, and so, so that leads to the other question is, uh, how useful is the processed data to researchers? Because it's actually meant to draw graphs rather than provide any, uh, you know, um, details, I think. So, so th that's actually something I'm wondering about. Are researchers actually making use of this processed data in any way? Um, so, so that's one question. Uh, th the other thing I want to know is, um, I have personally never come across anyone who said, oh, I looked at your DSC stats in 
DNS OARCs portal. So I, I do wonder about you know our you know the usefulness of our data in the in the DNS portal. Um, so so that's also something I'd like to hear about from either OARC or or the members here. You know, is anyone actually looking at our data and do they find it useful? Um, you know, because we we also want to. We, we also wonder about whether we should keep uploading it or not. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, those were my questions. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, I'll take a stab at that, Anand. Um, William, I don't know, may have additional comments. Um, I think that we know that the digital data is, is useful to researchers because we regularly have researchers who say we want to join the work because we want specific access to the digital data. The DSC data, um, I don't think we see as much interest from researchers, but it's kind of chicken and egg there. Um, certainly one thing that I have found that the DSC is very valuable for is if there is an incident of some sort. You know, for example, when um, earlier in the year when Mozilla introduced the any queries into Firefox without any warning. That showed up in the DSC. You, know, you could actually go to the DSC stats and you could, I'm sure your, your, your systems show this as well, and you could say that was a specific incident. So I suspect that some of the value of DSC is slightly more operational and ditto is more research, but you know, it's not clear cut. Um, so um, but I think there's also an issue of, you know, we know there are people out, researchers out there who are doing research into operational incidents and changes. So I think there's, a, there's, you know, there's an awareness issue as we've identified from the survey. William, did you want to add something? Yeah, just to add to that, um, and I, I have personally used your data for other purposes. Um, uh, I won't elaborate too much more, but I will say this. In my various travels through the analysis servers on occasion, I've never seen anybody actually go into programmatically into the, the NFS mounts to look at the DSC data per se. What I have received is over the past year, record or not, two complaints about how come this doesn't work? And that's when they go through the portal. So somebody is looking at this stuff visually, whether there's a researcher diving into the data aside from me tinkering, it's hard for me to say. Speaking as a tinkerer, your data is valuable. Okay, um, any other questions for Delaney? Okay, thank you. Okay, well, excellent. We're, we're, we're running quite well ahead, ahead of schedule, so you'll all get to break for lunch easy, early. Um, so one of the things that we do, um, that we have the possibility of at uh, OARC general meetings is to have member-only presentations. And sometimes the member-only presentations is it's for member eyes only. So it, you know, it's material that, um, that, that, that may be sensitive from a, an infrastructure security or protection point of view. We don't have one of these this time. Um, but we kept the slot open and, and I'm pleased to say that Ralph, um, Ralph Weber from Nominum, um, has stepped up and has, has some ideas that he'd like to share with you. Obviously, Nominum are, are um, sponsor for the meeting as well. Um, so again, I'd like to thank Ralph and team for sponsoring it, but this is not a sponsor presentation, this is a member presentation. And I'd just like to remind all of you as members that you, you, you have access to, 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 to give the closed member only presentation. Again, we're doing this morning's proceedings completely open in the interest of transparency because there are no secrets. Um, but this is the, the last piece of member business for the morning. Um, then we'll announce the election results. Um, and then, um, then we can all break for lunch. So I will hand you over to Ralph at this point. Yeah. Okay, so I want to uh, pre present or still working? Okay, good. So um, that I've been having in my mind for some time and uh, for work to endeavor on, and uh, I want to have your comments on that if you think it's a good idea or if I'm rubbish or whatever. So, um, so if anybody here has ever uh, done some of these stuff, I mean, uh, why does a domain not resolve and why doesn't a domain not resolve for me but for my ISP or vice versa? Or what uh, is basically, I mean, we are a software vendor uh, mostly on. Um, we saw more software on the recursive side. 
uh, when it comes to DNSSEC validation. Um, why does that validate? Why does it validate with bind or with unbound or all of these stuff? And uh, these are uh, questions you get also some, some, sometimes from your customers. And I just have, uh, if I ever can manage that, some examples that uh, we had over the years. And uh, uh, I mean, dot NZ was uh, one example where there was a, a tiny uh, kind of a different interpretation of the RFCs which kind of led to a top-level domain for, in this case, our server, be go dark. Um, NASA, Gov, I mean, we all know about that. Uh, there was another called Friends of Sleeping Bear, which uh, uh, was uh, affecting um, uh, basically an authoritative provider that then that decided not to answer anymore, and that the behave at least from one server, and the behavior that uh, we had was different from what others others had there. And recently, I mean, on the operational list, what happens if my NS record is a Z name? There has been some discussion then. Uh, with all these discussions, they come, I mean, we are, as a commercial vendor, at one point, our, one of our customers sends in support tick and asks, what are you doing? <laughs> and uh, uh, so these are things that happen, and if, especially if people who are, run, are on the recursive side of the business uh, are very interested to here, especially as there are lots of different implementations, and not all the implementations uh, are, are open source or, or available. And uh, even if they are, I mean, I've done testing with pretty much every uh, recursive software out there, but uh, sometimes I don't get it right because, I mean, my day job is handling the software that we write and not the software that others write. So that's what I think uh, it would be good if we have a constant test bit for all software at DNS ORC. So uh, authoritative and recursive and uh, maybe have some common configurations. I mean, we can decide on having done DNSSEC or non-DNSSEC and we could also say, well, every authoritative <laughs> server has to have a certain uh, set of subdomains with a certain set of parameters like different algorithms or different error types and, uh, and, that, and that should be uh, sort of uh, run by ORC and available uh, to uh, members or general public, I don't know yet. So um, with that, I want to actually open up the discussions. What do you think about that? I mean, we can discuss who will provide what. I mean, I'm certainly for Nominum would be up to, uh, in that test bed, basically take care of our servers. Uh, I hope others, other vendors also sort of do the same, and I mean, what kind of infrastructure is needed, what kind of, uh, and I think some, one already did some work there before, especially on how you set up kind of different zones for the authorities to kind of have all the corner cases uh, covered, and maybe we can use that. And again, I mean, do we want to have that member only or to the general public uh, op opinions? I mean, what do people think? Uh, this is Maarten Willink from SIDN. Um, just to let you know, my uh, colleague, Jelte Jansen, has developed uh, what we call the uh, DNS Workbench, which is a platform with, with uh, I believe, seven authoritative name servers running uh, yeah, what you call corner cases and uh, DNSSEC yeah. validation problems and stuff like that. And yeah, the, and the Workbench is publicly available. I don't know how much use is being made of it, um, mm -hmm. but it could be maybe incorporated in something like this. Um, yeah, so I mean, certainly I'm, I'm interested in hearing that. I'm open yeah. to kind of collaborate, collaborate with you, you, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. You, I'll, you, I'll, I'll find you offline. And yeah, okay, great. Stuff. William, DNS Orc. Um, for the record, Orc does have 16, 12 surfers, uh, which comprise of a DNS lab that's been languishing for the past two years. It feels unloved and I was gonna kill it. Uh, I suppose I shouldn't kill it. Uh, but the lab is there for members to use. It's, they're set up so that uh, you can use any operating system you wanna boot off to them by network and then set up and build that or not build that or build a, a, some type of thing that will do this for you. And it's, it's been there for two years, it's not been used. Actually, the last person who used it was Dave Knight. So. Um, he would be the best person to talk to about whether or not that was useful to him. 
uh, but it's there for members for the time being. It is on my hit list. Um, but if there is a use for it, then uh, we'll find a way to keep it going in some form. Thanks. Uh, Paul Hoffman with ICANN. Um, wearing a hat from a few years ago, um, VeriSign had me work on a project called DNS Harness, which does what you're suggesting, but lets everyone have it on their own box. Um, so basically, if you had a, all, all you needed was a Linux box with lots of disk space and processor time. Yeah, but I mean, a lot of the software out there, I mean, is not available sort of for public consumption. I mean, our software you have to buy. And Correct. Microsoft or Secure64 or we have other members that are kind of uh, in the commercial software business that I would also like to have on the test bed. And Certainly. And, and, and I had tried to design it to allow those, you know, for somebody who had a license or some, mm -hmm. and some of them run on hardware to be able to tie in. Um, so it, I think having a something that people can all use is fine. Um, I want to say the same thing that William did, though, which is that after I did it and people had seen it, it's pretty much as languished. So I'm not sure how much interest there actually was in it. But uh, s um, having setting up something like this is not that difficult. And I've done a lot of the unfortunate legwork of figuring out things like how to build legacy bind 8 and bind 4 and such like that for an environment like this. And if there's interest, we can certainly leverage that old work into this. Okay, thanks. Hello, uh, Robert Edmonds, Farsight Security. Uh, could you go back to the proposal slide? Uh, you say uh, authoritative and recursing software? Yeah. Uh, why not client software as well? Uh, I think Firefox was mentioned earlier, and there are uh, you know, many you know, stub resolvers under development you know, actively, uh, you know, having CVEs filed and whatnot. Uh, and they presumably generate the vast majority of, of uh, client packets on the internet, right? Yeah, I mean, why not? We need, I mean, it's, it comes a bit of a problem with accessing, I mean, if you have client libraries like Windows, I mean, you need to access the box somewhere to do some stuff. Uh, but, I mean, people probably can figure that out, yeah. Andre Suri, Seasonic. Um, you may you might remember that uh, when we started DNS benchmarking, we have been constantly calling for some neutral party doing that. And so we have some stuff we can use even for recursive right now, and, but there hasn't been a lot of interest, and I'm also afraid that who, who will pay for this? Well, this is not, not for... Uh, um Benchmarking. Uh, I, I understand. More, more for functional testing. And the, the, the pay for it, that's why I want to. I mean, if <coughs> DNS ORC provides a platform and the members that are software vendors kind of take care of the uh, uh, basically running of their systems on, on, on this box, then that's the model I would suggest. Yes, I understand it's not about benchmarking, but uh, it's kind of related to, to have some common platform and. Um, I haven't seen a lot of interest, that, although I would really love to love to have this. So, I mean, uh, from from the people on the mic, I saw at least some interest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and if you've interest, I've interest. I, I, okay. I, hope, I hope this, will, this okay. will fly. Thanks. This is uh, Stefan Laurent from Microsoft. I think it's a good idea, and especially on the, on the recursive side, I don't see why vendors like Microsoft or Nominum or not or anybody else who has a recursive resolver, they can set up their own system and maybe ACL it down and then if we have a central you know, web type GUI that can go in and send a query to all known variants of DNS mm -hmm. servers, you know, I, I would encourage and I would be willing to participate. And would you also participate as Microsoft in running a system there? You know, I think each, uh, I mean the internet, we could run our system on our own side of things and we'll use provide an IP address for that yeah. central GUI to, uh, to query, right? So I don't, mm -hmm. I don't think, I mean, once it starts to get into hardware and deploying stuff and maintaining stuff, it gets tricky, right? I, I'm, I'm better, I mean, if, if the software vendor wants their stuff to work properly, they, we can set it up ourselves and then just give an IP address to somebody for, to query and then centrally query all of those servers at the same time, right? So you, I'm envisioning kind of like a web GUI, you type in a domain and you hit submit and it goes to Google, to a Microsoft server, a Nominum server, a Bind server, and it gives you the results, the mm -hmm. dig output from, from all of those. Yeah. Uh, 
David Lawrence Akamai. I think the interest level is actually hard to gauge uh, because there are many times when we're all asking these questions, but we don't know, conceive of a centralized location where we could go to answers for them other than asking on mailing lists. Like I can tell you at Akamai, at least once a month, we'll have a question come up about how do resolvers handle this particular situation? And this would be an ideal situation, ideal setup to go and actually find out how a variety of them hand, you know, handle something so we can you know, make our decision from there. And I will add, uh, since Paul didn't mention it, he's also done a lot of recent work on uh, DNS conformance testing, which I think would be a wonderful addition to the suite to be able to test them. Like we can take advantage right now of testing one server at once, but you know, being able to hit them all would be fantastic. So. Yeah. Hi, Benno Overeiner and Nelder Labs. A uh, small comment on, on the performance testing, uh, Andre just uh, mentioned mm -hmm. also. We had a, a, a small uh, master project uh, on uh, Resolver uh, performance benchmarking. The reasons were not that interesting, but what was interesting how the corner cases were evaluated or resolved. Mm -hmm. So looking at performance sometimes cannot explain everything, and then you look, go more in detail, and then you get more, well, more functional differences between the resolvers and mm -hmm. some inside. So just, I can share the report. Mm -hmm. Just but skip. Again, I mean, and 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 would also be willing to participate in that? Yeah. Okay, good, thanks. And just skip the performance results and go into the corner case evaluation. Yeah. That's, that's the interesting part. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Joe Gersh from Secure64. I think anytime any of these events happen, it erodes public confidence in DNSSEC and that's gonna stall things like the Dane adoption and other stuff. So what you're talking about is very important. Secure64 would definitely participate in such an effort. Okay, thanks. Hi, it's John Dickinson from Synodin. Um, the other thing that you, you haven't mentioned is things like different operating systems, uh, net, user space, network stacks, uh, kernel Yeah, this comes more tuning in and that kind of thing. I think it would be really useful have a test bed. I want to build one, but I haven't got the time to do it. So, mm. um, if those kind of things could be covered where, as well. Where do you think, from the DNS perspective, do the operating systems differ on the functional level? Uh, well, I guess the first, the main area is probably is performance. Um, and so. the, the the problem with, I mean. That why I kind of restricted it to functional with, uh, and not performance is for these functional tests, if you have a couple of VMs running, this, this is probably okay. If you want to do performance tests, you need yeah. bare metal, and yeah. you need kind of fast networks and reliable networks between that. So the amount of um, kind of hardware you need to invest in that is much, much larger than if it is just for functional testing. Yeah, I completely agree. Hi, Ray Bellis, ISC. Uh, there is at least one instance I'm aware of where the operating system does matter, and that's in things like uh, IPv6 uh, MCU discovery, where I'm led to believe that the differences in BSD and Linux stacks are somewhat different and can actually cause operational difficulties. Okay. Uh, David Lawrence, how I again? I think you actually would probably want to deliberately cripple it from being used for performance testing, so this doesn't somehow end up in campaign materials about see how we outperform in this test bed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, again, it's not, not focus on the functional and yeah, make exactly. sure it's not being used for performance. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, so I'm um, just sort of wearing the, the executive hat to comment on this. Um, thank you, Ralph, for the proposal. Um, this is the kind of space that people have expressed interest in OARC doing for a while. Um, the concern that I have is it might be a boil the ocean project. Um, which is the, 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 the matrix of all the different dimensions of how many different bits of software, what you test, what combinations, could be very large. So we would need to find a way um, in order to focus this. Um, in other words, if we're gonna do this, it could potentially take a lot of resources. Now, I'm totally fine with scaling up ORC. It's one of the things that we want to do. But I think the question I would pose to you, the members, is, um, is this something that you're willing to contribute additional funding and or resources to OARC in order to do that? Um, um, you know, perhaps you could a show of hands if that's something that you'd be interested in, in supporting us to do. Okay. Um, thank you. So, 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 so potentially we can follow this up. Is there, is there any way that you would like to take this forward, Ralph, in particular? 
I mean, I, there, there was, um, from at least from the vendor, there was some interest in it. So uh, maybe we can follow it up on the, on the member list. Uh, and I've kind of tried to maybe define it a bit more uh, precise, mm -hmm. send around, and then uh, have the members uh, kind of discuss it on the member list. Yeah, or, or we could set up a dedicated list mm -hmm. once we, we identify those who are. Yeah, they seem to die, so. <laughs> okay, um, any other comments or questions on this? Okay, thank you very much, Raul. Okay, I'm sorry the beaver attacked the microphone earlier. Um, okay, we're nearly um, ready for lunch. Um, just to um, remind you that lunch is basically you go up the escalators and um, um, stairs, one floor, and then up again, and then it's in the Hochelager room. Um, we're trying to bring lunch forward from 12.30 to, 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 to noon. The reality will probably be somewhere in between, and we'll resume at 2 p.m. Um, again, thank you to um, Sarah as our um, main and um, social sponsor, and to Nominum as our, as our other sponsor for the, for, for the meeting. Um, so the one thing we have to do before lunch is that we have a result from the election. Um, so I will um, hand you over to Andre as, uh, as board chair to announce that result. Okay, thank you very much, Keith. So, uh, as usually, we use the STV, Single Transferable Vote System. Uh, we received 29 ballots and uh, two proxies, so that's 39 in total. Uh, two of them were invalid, unfortunately. And uh, the results are that all the elected uh, people are Duane, Dave Knight, and Paul Ebersman. Uh, so thank you very much and congratulations. <laughs> and uh, now is the time to thank uh, Jim Garvin. He's unfortunately not here, so I cannot thank him in person, but uh, uh, the, I think in the next meeting I will do it, but uh, we have to thank him for serving as a board member. And uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, we need to thank him for his great work for the DNS Work Board. And that's all from my side. Thank you very much. <laughs>